This is October 16, 2007. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged today to have David A. Whitmore. Welcome, Dave. Hi. May I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in Needham. Uh, and it was 1928, and November 6th. Pardon? November 6th, November as a matter of fact. You have a birthday coming up. What, where do you currently live? Oak Ridge Avenue, Natick. And how long have you lived there? Since 1958. Just as an aside, do you see a lot of changes in Natick from 58 oh, to yes. the present yeah. time? Yeah. What strikes you most? Well, it's much more built up. In fact, Arbor Circle was not there when we moved in. That's a new development in your area? Yes, uh -huh. right next to it. It certainly helped my, uh, the value of my house. Uh, but, and also, uh, after years and years of complaining to the town about uh, plowing the dead end section in front of my driveway, uh, they finally do it because Arbor Circle is there. So that's also helped you in some way. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, what is your marital status? Uh, widowed. And do you have children? Three. Grandchildren? One. Do they live in the area? Uh, my grandchild lives in, uh, yeah, begins with an M, <laughs> down is. The southern part of the state, uh, about 20, 20 miles from here, mm -hmm. um, and uh, my children, one of them lives in New Hampshire, uh, my daughter lives in uh, Maine, Biddeford, and uh, my youngest son lives in that town I mentioned. <laughs> so they are within driving distance at least. Yes, yeah. It's, or they can uh, drive to visit you. Yeah, it's 115 miles up to my daughter's place, I think. Where and when did you enter the military? <sighs> Let's see, it was 1952, I think. Uh, I had uh, my, the company I worked for up in Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, managed to uh, stall off the draft board for three years. So I was, uh, I believe, 23 when I went, finally went into the service. Age 23. Mm-hmm. And I uh, didn't want to go in the Army anyhow, so I just let myself be drafted uh, because that was two years. Any other way would have been three or four years. Meaning you would have to stay in for two years rather than three or four years? Yeah, right. And you said you didn't want to go into the Army. Did you go into the Army? I did, yeah. You were drafted mm -hmm. into the Army. Yep. At the time you were working, what kind of work did you do? Uh, let's see. You worked for a so, company in Manchester, and, yeah, New Hampshire. Yeah, I was I was a lab technician, and at Northeastern uh, was it a medical? It was Northeast Engineering, I think it was called. Had you gone to school for that? Uh, yes, uh, two years, uh, junior college. And at the time, were you single? Oh, yes. Did family or friends join the service when you did? Did they also get drafted at that time? Um, well, I have three cousins, male. Uh, they lived in, lived in Needham at the time. And I know my oldest one uh, went into the Marines. And uh, I'm not sure about the other two. All boys. 
Where were you sent for basic training? Uh, I believe it was Camp Gordon, Georgia. I, I'm not, I think it's a fort by now. But at the time it was Camp Gordon. Yep. Tell us what it was like. <sighs> well, this was boot camp. <laughs> what, can I, what else can I say? Uh, lots going. of marching and so, so on. Was it tiring for you? Was, it, was there times when you felt a little intimidated by it? No, um, I just didn't want to be there. <laughs> uh, now the draft was happening, the World War II was over, mm -hmm. but the draft continued? Yes, so I, I believe the, uh, well, the Korean War was on. What were you hearing about that? Um, well, everybody that was drafted, at least, uh, wanted to go to uh, Germany which was occupied by that time. Uh, but most of, most of us got sent to the Far East. Let's back up then, mm -hmm. before that. Um, you were in boot camp. Mm -hmm. How long were you there for? I think it was uh, eight weeks, something like that. Was it determined that you had any kind of special expertise or that they would train you in something further? Well, I must have aced uh, one of the uh, tests that they gave us because I was uh, eventually sent to Fort Monmouth for further training. And where is Fort Monmouth? New Jersey. And what kind of future training was that? Uh, well, I, I, they offered me uh, training in either radar uh, VHF or transmitters and uh, so I took VHF because I was not too familiar with that. Now was it because from your previous job as a lab tech that you did have some? Probably yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you took VHF VHF. Yes. And tell me about that. What did that include? Well it stands for very high frequency um, and uh, it's used for point-to-point, -point, uh, fairly close communications. It's not a long-distance thing. Was it something fairly new? I think so, yes. Of course, everything at the time was tubes, not transistors. <laughs> and after that training at Fort Monmouth, where did you go? Uh, then I was sent to the Far East and uh, we got to Yokohama and surprise, surprise, uh, about six of us were taken off and uh, we stayed in Tokyo. Now when you say taken off, taken mm -hmm. off? Off the ship, which continued on to Korea. So you went over by ship. Yes. So talk about that experience. Was that difficult for you? No, it wasn't. Uh, we uh, left from uh, L.A., I believe it was. Uh, and I was in Camp Stoneman for a while, just waiting to go. And, uh, but when we got to Stoneman, it was pitch black. And uh, we went to the Quartermaster's Corps and they gave us blankets and so on and said, down the road, uh, but there were no lights. So we went where they, uh, we thought they had told us and stumbled into a barracks which had, had no lights, found cots and uh, put ourselves in the bed. And uh, the next morning, uh, there was no reveille for us. Uh, and. Uh, does that mean you actually got to sleep in? Yeah, well, yeah we didn't wake up till nine o'clock or so. <laughs> and uh, uh, we kept an eye on uh, or an ear on things uh, where they were having a, a uh, group of soldiers ready to ship out. And uh, finally, uh, uh, some of us heard our names and went and joined the group. 
And, uh, but uh, we just show up for mess and get seated and, and feed. <laughs> so did you know ahead of time that you would be going to the Far East? Well, uh, there was a possibility of going to Germany, but pretty slim. And, and your preference would have been Germany? Oh, yes. Yeah. Why? No fighting over there. At the it time. It was just occupation. And, uh, so you took the boat over, yeah. and um, you were in Yokohama, mm -hmm. and you said six of you were pulled out. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, probably because of our specialties. Uh, where uh, the rest of the crew went on to Korea and uh, uh, I ended up uh, living in the, the former Imperial Palace Guards barracks, terrazzo tile floors and uh, the only problem was that for about six weeks in the spring, there was a monsoon, and the floors were continuously wet, just condensation. And uh, we used to take uh, most of our uniforms, take them to the dry cleaners, and leave them there <laughs> during that period, then pick them up later. And uh, being servicemen, it didn't cost us much. And. Uh, the guards' quarters, what were they like? Well, as I said, they uh, the concrete building mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, uh, I don't know, I couldn't tell you how many rooms. One of them, uh, I believe, was the USO, and I spent a good deal of time there. Now, tell us about were you welcome there after what had occurred to end the war, World War II and then a few years later you're in? I never had any problem no at all. Um, the one thing I remember is that if we went out to eat, we would have to find a restaurant with a big A uh, in the window because uh, the Japanese at that time anyhow uh, used to grow humongous carrots, yay long, but they were fertilized morning and night with human waste. Mm -hmm. So the Army didn't want us ha having any so problems. So an A meant Army could go in, it yeah. was okay. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you see much with regards to devastation from the previous war? No, not in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. uh, Hiroshima, I think, was being rebuilt at the time, and uh, Nagasaki, I think, was the other place on A-bomb landed. So on a daily basis, what were you doing? Um, well, I ended up in a uh, transmitter station on, uh, in Tokyo Bay. Uh, we were, I believe there was a causeway, and we were taken by bus out there for our shift, uh, which, by the way, changed uh, every three months or so. That is, one, one three month we'd be on uh, eight to six or something like that. And uh, the next time would be from six to midnight or something like that. And uh, uh, then there was a the third, the graveyard shift. And uh, the, I was in charge of the VHF room, uh, but uh, I was also called on to make do maintenance on the transmitters. Uh, they'd have us take the tubes out, shut the thing down, take tubes out, dust them down, and uh, then put them back. And some of the tubes were pretty large, like that big around, or, or that high. Hard to believe, Maybe isn't that it? wide. Hmm? Hard to believe that yeah. they were that big at that time. Yeah, and they, they, were, they would handle, uh, there were two in each uh, of the normal transmitters, and uh, what they called push-pull. And uh, uh, the, uh, just had to be 
cleaned and put back. And uh, uh, I, so that was in addition to the VHF room duties. Were some of your transmissions of interest? Uh, were they confidential? We didn't, couldn't hear them. Uh, I think the audio came in and went right into the transmitters, and uh, the audio came from a, a different station. So you had to make sure that everything was working appropriately so someone was receiving this information? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had to uh, change the frequencies to what we were asked to, to, uh, to do, and uh, that it applied both to the VHF and to the transmitter room. While doing this, were you... Um, able to get information about what was happening in Korea? Not really. Um, we were just happy not to be there. <laughs> How long were you in the Tokyo area? Um, I think it was 15 months. And then where did you go? Uh, back to the States. and. Uh, uh, Oh, one thing I should mention, uh, when I uh, first went in, uh, they made a call for Marines, and I was amazed at how many guys jumped, took it. Even those who were in the Army, you mean they could do that? Or yes, yeah. You could switch? Yes. Uh, Why did they do that? Of course, you were in for four years there. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they did that? I have no idea. Were you ever in direct combat? No, no. Uh, when you went back to the States, were you, were you still an enlisted man? Mm -hmm. you, and how long did you stay in? Um, let's see, I think it was uh, a couple of months shy of two years. Uh, the Army, in their wisdom, decided to cancel us out early, and I think they needed the space. This was in Devons. Fort Devons? Yeah. You came back to Fort Devons? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was your rank at that time? Corporal. I think there had been a freeze on, uh, of course, if you were a private, you automatically, as soon as you got through basic, you were uh, promoted to uh, PFC. Uh, but beyond that, I think there was a freeze, so I didn't get corporal until uh, I was about to come home. And once you came home, did you go back to work at the same job you were at? or? Um, I went to the same company, and they didn't show any particular interest in my being there, so I, I went to work for Raytheon instead. And how long were you with Raytheon? 35 years. And Raytheon... I didn't plan it that way, but... <laughs> but it happens, yeah. yeah. And at Raytheon, did you continue to work on any special defense programs or projects? Yes. Um, first of all, I went into the hearing aid lab, and transistors were just coming on the scene. So I got in on the bottom of that. and. Uh, uh, I finally ended up a senior engineer. Working with transistors? Mm-hmm, mostly, and integrated circuits by that time. And in doing that work, were you ever called upon to um, work directly with any of the defense? Uh, once in a while I would get called off onto projects like uh, Sparrow, Talk about Sparrow. What was that? Uh, that was a, uh, I believe, a, a, an air-to-air -air missile. Also, uh, I got in on Hawk some, somewhat, which was a ground-to-air missile. And that Much was Much bigger, by the way. And when you say you got in on it, that you helped to put these together? I did some design. Uh, and little pieces of it, I'm, I'm sure. And helping with the design, did you go anywhere to, to view that these missiles worked? 
sometimes uh, they do no, testing? No, I don't think so. Uh, we had some uh, faked tests. That is, uh, at one point we had a radar uh, and a plane piloted. I was at, uh, in Bedford at the Air, uh, Hanscom, and uh, so they had a, a jet which uh, at one point flew low over us to see how the radar behaved. And um, uh, this was out in Sterling, I think. They had to be out where the population was small. Do you ever feel that anything that you helped with might have been detrimental to small populations or areas that were doing well, the testing? Well, uh, you didn't want to get too close to a radar because of the radiation could fry things that are not supposed to be fried. And did any of you or your co-workers have any side effects from any of that? Not that I know of. <clears throat> when you talk, going back a little bit, about the six who were brought together and didn't go on to Korea, did mm. you maintain re relationships with those no, other five? No. And did you stay in contact with any of the individuals that you were in the service with? No, we were just glad to get out. <laughs> and having gotten out, when you came home, were you, did you talk anything about what you did, or did life go on as usual? No, life went on pretty much as usual. Uh, <clears throat> and when exactly and where were you discharged? Was it at Fort Devens? Yes. Yeah. Do you remember what year? Well, I was in for a little less than two, two years. Two years, so. you said. And you went in in f the early 50s? Yeah. yeah. 50, 1952, I so think, yeah. approximately 1954. Yeah. And you stayed with Raytheon. Um, as time went on, what other things did you help with in your engineering background? Well, uh, <clears throat> the company went through a couple of uh, different programs for circuit analysis. And um, the last 10 years I was with them, I, I think I, I made models of electronic items to be used by other people in, in analyzing their circuits. And that was very interesting. And what, approximately, what year did you retire from Raytheon? <sighs> Retired when I was 60. Uh, and I'm 78 now, so <laughs> you do the math. 18 years ago. Yeah. So you've seen a lot happen with regards to, as you mentioned, the transistor. Mm -hmm versus current day. Mm -hmm. What do you think of all these changes, technology changes? I think they're great. Do you keep up with a lot of that type of information with your background? Not terribly, no. <clears throat> Did you, when you came home, join any unit of the military reserve? No. Did you join any veterans organizations such nope. as the American I'm not a, Legion? I'm not what you call a joiner. Have you received or utilized any of the veterans' benefits for things such as hospitalization or the GI Bill or uh, insurance? No, I think I fell through the cracks. <laughs> I think there was an opportunity which I did not take and what about any reunions with your old outfit, no? No. Nope. But looking back, how important do you feel serving in the military was for you, and how do you feel it affected your life? Well, <clears throat> I don't think it affected it terribly much. Uh, like I said before, I didn't particularly want to go in. 
When you talk back about going into boot camp, um, did it teach you any kind of discipline that maybe you didn't have before? It probably did, but uh, hard to pin down as to exactly what. Do you remember any kind of mem memorable experiences when you were in the military? Well, when I was in Camp Gordon, we were in, I think I was on the second floor of a two-story barracks. And uh, of course, we had to maintain the barracks. And uh, one night, one guy was uh, mopping the floor, uh, putting wax on the floor, and I was holding the jug. And he came back. With the, with the broom and knocked it out of my arms and it landed on my foot and broke. <laughs> the foot broke or the jug broke? The jug broke. Oh dear. And cut my foot. And uh, so they uh, sent for an ambulance and I was hauled off to the uh, medical unit. And uh, so they put in a couple of stitches, no, no anesthesia, and uh, sent me on my way walking back to, the, back to the barracks. And you had stitches in your foot mm -hmm. without any kind of Novocaine or no, anything like that? No. Do you remember the pain? Uh, not really. Uh, it must have hurt, but... Uh, Did you find that the uh, members of the community of Tokyo were accepting of the American GI being there? Never had any problem. Mm -hmm. uh, this was probably a couple of years after they'd been conquered. Um. Above all, is there a thought or an incident that you'd like to share with your family or others who will see this tape? What was the last, that last part? Any type of thought or incident or something you would like to share with anyone who might be viewing this tape about your experiences? I don't think so. I think I've made my position pretty clear. When you look on today, do you have a sense that Ser serving your country is appropriate, that um, others should go into the service, into branches of the service, mandatory, such as what you had to do? Uh, they seem to be getting along pretty well with volunteer. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want to be in Iran, or Iraq rather. Do you have members of your family or friends who are over there currently? Uh, my youngest son had uh, been in, uh, the, it was, he was in the Army, but he was stationed at a naval air station because he worked on large helicopters and there wasn't room for the helicopters in the uh, Army Air Force. Uh, so. Uh, he was in a detached unit, which is, uh, as probably most everybody will tell you, is uh, the best arrangement. And where was he stationed? When in you Japan. In Japan. When yep. was that? Oh, pardon me. He was in Hawaii. In Hawaii. Yep. Uh, at uh, Eva Beach, I think it was. Recently? No, quite a while ago. Uh, he wasn't married at the time. He is now. And... Uh, uh, he's pretty much of a clam, too. Uh, we didn't find out for several years afterwards that uh, he had uh, to handle a, a load that a uh, helicopter was picking up. He would be at the hole where it was going to come through and with only uh, somebody holding his ankles. <laughs> So that was fairly hazardous work. Yes, I would say so. Did yeah. he have any interesting stories about that? Uh, well, he, as I said, he's pretty much a clam. Uh, so he wasn't 
eager to tell us about it, but it did come out after a while. Is there anything we haven't asked you or any additional comments that you'd like to make before the end of this interview? Um, no, I can't think of any. Well, David A. Whitmore, we do appreciate your coming in today and telling us your story. You're Thank entirely you welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.